Welcome to the Breath Support Summit. We are so excited to have you all here. This program consists of video exercises where you can follow along using your tools and materials with us while we go through these physical exercises. But there are two lecture chapters as well, just because I found that a lot of my clients, even the ones who sing professionally, don't have clear, exact answers on some of the basic anatomy that we use. So I promise they will be very short and very to the point, just so that we all make sure that we're on the same page as to what is scientific fact and what are some of the classical singer metaphors that we use that aren't necessarily accurate. So without further ado, let's jump into our first lecture chapter. Here we go. So first things first, we need to talk about our goals. Here's what you should be able to do and understand by the end of this program. We're going to go through and bust myths and learn real facts. We're going to discover body awareness, which you will do in our follow along video exercises. We're then going to teach you conscious control. That is how to turn this feeling on and off in the body whenever you would like. And then, of course, lastly, we're going to apply these new skills to singing or to your musical instrument if you're an instrumentalist. So let's talk about why we need breath support. Breath support is one of those phrases that gets thrown around quite a lot, but it's important to come back to these basics. So breath support provides us more beautiful tone, it provides us more stamina or ease, and it actually is required to perform certain tasks and skills. That is to say, there are certain skills that both singers and instrumentalists do that cannot be done without correct breath support. One example is high notes. Um, I know some clients who go through and do some of these exercises and actually add on pitches to the top of their range because they're now able to provide the breath support that they need up there. So we'll talk about that more later. But until then, it's important to remind ourselves of these basic ideas. So let's give ourselves a quick review of the basic job descriptions of all of the anatomical areas that we're going to use. So singing or playing an instrument has two jobs, right? The inhalation or the prep and the exhalation or the sound. Here's a list of all of the anatomical groups that belong to each of those functions. Now, this may seem painfully obvious, but I wanted to bring this up because I know that a lot of singing teachers and even some instrumentalist teachers will talk about areas of the body that aren't necessarily pertinent. And what I mean by that is a lot of us have the D word diaphragm thrown around all the time. And a lot of us singing students have heard teachers talk to us about what our larynx should be doing and what our vocal folds would should be doing. And it's important to remind ourselves that those muscles are involuntary. That is the diaphragmic muscle and the muscles involved in the larynx and the vocal folds, which are membranes and not muscles. They are all involuntary, which means that you cannot control them with your brain, which is basically like your heart. Your heart is an involuntary muscle. We don't sit here and think to ourselves, okay, I have to keep my heart beating. And it's important for us to remember this because a lot of us spend time directing our inner monologue to these areas. And it honestly, to be frank, is a complete waste of time because we should be focusing on the things that we do have active control over. So what is that? That is the rib cage or what we're going to call the thoracic cylinder and the abdominal cylinder or all of the muscles that make up the belly or the abdominal region. Those we can actively control. And ironically, here you are at the Breath Support Summit, but those are the two things that a lot of people do not spend enough time controlling, which is why we are here and why we are going to focus on just those two things. So the first of these two groups that we're going to talk about is the thoracic cylinder. And a layman term for that is just the rib cage area and everything that's contained within it. So that includes your heart and your lungs as well. Now, most of us know that 
in order to create good sound, whether that's through singing or playing our instrument, that we are going to inhale and expand the rib cage in 360 degrees. And then we are going to maintain that expanded position and then create breath support. Now, a lot of us are familiar with the intercostal muscles and the external intercostal muscles. That's great, but it's actually not the whole story because here is a list of just some of the muscles that are involved in that entire process in the thoracic cylinder. And as you can see, it's more than just the intercostal muscles. So if you would like to learn the rest of their names, by all means, go for it. But frankly, it doesn't matter because all of the muscles that are involved in that process in the thoracic cylinder have to work together as a unit in order to achieve that result. So you are more than welcome to go through and learn all of them, but they're not firing individually. They're firing as a group. Now, certain muscles of that group may be contributing a little bit more and a little bit less, but again, this is not an isolatory movement in any way. They are all contributing in some form or another. So that's why as we go through this, I'm going to maintain my firm position that we're just gonna talk about all of these ideas as a whole because I don't see the point in breaking things down into their teeniest, tiniest atoms if they're all functioning together anyway. So let's continue with the thoracic cylinder here. We are going to inhale and expand the ribs, and then we are going to maintain that new expanded position that we've created. And here comes the tricky part for most people. We are now going to create pressure. Now, how the heck do we do that? Well, most of us, even some of our teachers, even some of our very famous and very well-known teachers have the wrong idea that pressure is created in this upwards throwing up motion or feeling, and that is absolutely incorrect. When we create pressure inside the body, we are not forcing it in one direction upwards, nor are we forcing it in one direction downwards. We are creating pressure in 360 degrees. We are 360 degree beings. We are 3D and we exist in a 3D world. We do not have the wherewithal to direct internal pressure in just one plane of motion or one plane of direction. It is functioning in all directions. So I want you to particularly notice that not only are we creating pressure outwards sideways, but we are also creating pressure downwards and upwards. Now, we're not pulling anything inwards like when you're trying to look skinnier at the pool. What is happening is we're using our bodies like the air inside of a ball. When the air is inside a ball, it is pressing against the ball from the inside in all directions. That is what is happening. It is an outwards pressing motion but it's not just an outwards press down or an outwards press up, like a throw up. It is all directions, and you will feel this for yourself later, so if this still doesn't make cerebral sense, that's okay. Just go with me for a second because we will be feeling this in our very first exercise. So let's go a little bit deeper into this abdominal cylinder. This highlighted area here is everything that's involved in the abdominal cylinder. That includes all of the abdominal muscles, all of the viscera, all of the organs that sit within there. So that is quite a lot of stuff. Your intestines, your abdominal muscles, your stomach, your gallbladder, if you still have it. <laughs> so there's a lot going on in here. But what is creating pressure is obviously the muscles of the abdominal cylinder. So here's a list of just some of the muscles that create the abdominal cylinder. 
You can see it's quite a hefty list, but the good news is that once again, it doesn't matter if you learn all of their names because in order to create internal abdominal pressure, all of those muscles that make up the abdominal cylinder have to fire together as a unit. Again, it is impossible to isolate one particular muscle group and perform this pressurizing function. Now, not all of the muscles may be firing at 100%, but they are all firing simultaneously and they are all working as a unit. So therefore, it doesn't really matter if we're focused on one more than the other because they always function as a unit. And in fact, it is neurologically impossible to isolate a particular ab muscle group while you are pressurizing like this. It is possible to isolate a particular abdominal muscle group when doing other motions and other functions, but while we are pressurizing, it is not possible to fire or to isolate a particular muscle group. So that is why as we continue through this journey together, we're only gonna talk about the two cylinders as a whole because they always function and they always fire as a whole when they're working correctly. But I do want to take just a slight pause to talk a little bit more about the abdominal cylinder because when it comes to singers and instrumentalists, there is certain aspects of the cylinder that is important for us to have more information about. You will notice that the diaphragm is what makes up this lid portion of the abdominal cylinder and the pelvic floor is what makes up the floor part of the abdominal cylinder. So I will say this 10 million times, the diaphragm and the pelvic floor are still firing as part of the abdominal cylinder when we're pressurizing, but it's important for us to visually understand how they sit in the body. And that is, they sit in almost direct opposition to each other. So if I turn our skeleton man to the front here, I want you to notice that the diaphragm and the pelvic floor both make a slight cup shape. And here's a better visual of that cupped bottom of the pelvic floor muscles. And so when I overlay the rest of the abdominal muscles here, you can see the six pack muscle that we're all familiar with you'll notice that it creates this visual shape of sort of like a jelly bean or frankly, sort of like a cylinder. So all of that abdominal region really is almost entirely enclosed by all of the muscles. That is the abdominal muscles and the diaphragm on the top and the pelvic floor on the bottom. And so on the inside, we genuinely look like little jelly beans like this that are filled not necessarily with air, but we're filled with all of that viscera or all of the rest of the organs. So we really are sort of balloons filled with viscera on the inside. And it is this little jelly bean or this cylindrical muscular balloon that we are pressurizing in order to create breath support. Here's a romanticized view of what it would look like from the back. You can see the darker area on the top and bottom signifies the diaphragm on top and the pelvic floor on the bottom and the rest of the abdominal muscle. So now that we've discovered the muscles of the thoracic and abdominal cylinders, let's talk about how they function with one another. In order to create correct breath support, we need both cylinders and they need to work in a balanced way. The thoracic cylinder, since it contains the bones of the rib cage, provides a brace or the physical support for the abdominal cylinder to press against, and the abdominal cylinder is what creates the pressure. Now, I don't wanna to get too deep into physics, but we don't need to overthink this too much because in order to create pressure, there has to be 
something to press against. For example, if you were floating out in space, there's not any pressure out there because there's nothing to press against. So in order to create pressure anywhere, there needs to be something to press against and there needs to be something doing the pressing. So that's what's happening here. The thoracic cylinder is providing the support from the rib cage bones. The bones are hard and so when we press against them, they do not move. And the abdominal cylinder, since it's a little squishier, is what is doing the pressing upon the thoracic cylinder. So there's no need to overthink this. The only thing that you need to understand is that we need both of these to be working in a balance of effort. That's all you need to know. Now, the balance isn't always 50-50. We can have the abdominal cylinder working a little bit more than the thoracic cylinder. Let's say if you wanted to sing a high note, that takes a little bit more abdominal pressure, right, than singing a low note. Whereas if we're singing a low note, the thoracic cylinder is going to be doing a little bit more work than the abdominal cylinder. Again, that's okay. We're not always going to be splitting the effort 50-50, but we do have to be putting effort into both cylinders all the time. We can't have all abdominal cylinder and nothing in the thoracic because the system will collapse. So again, it doesn't have to be perfectly balanced, but it does need to be balanced actively. That is, both cylinders need to be firing so that we have an active balance of effort between them. So that is what Phil and I propose as the correct definition of breath support. Breath support is the active balance of effort between the thoracic cylinder and the abdominal cylinder to create pressurized air. So that's it. I don't want to go any deeper into this lecturing thing because you're going to feel exactly what I'm talking about as soon as we jump into this. So let's go. Grab your ball, grab your TheraBand, make sure you clear a large space on your floor so that you have room to move around and you can follow along with us. And let's jump in and start our very first exercise.